to her right. I have my chief of staff uh, from Austin here, Jordan Overturf. I have Lyle Drescher, uh, who lives right down the road from you guys. He still hasn't decided to move to Robeson yet. He's over in, what, what's the development called where you live? Country Lakes. Country Lakes, so right down the street from you. So um, why, you know, first question I guess people would ask is why, why would you do this? And most of you know that we get, uh, in the 70s, they decided that we would get paid 600 a month to go down there and represent you. And, uh, you know, that, that doesn't exactly pay the bills. In fact, I talked to Matt Schaefer yesterday, and he said, you know, I, one, I'm missing all this, I mean, he's, getting, he's getting ready to retire. He said, I'm missing all this opportunity with my kids and my wife. And two, you know, you gotta make hay while the sun's shining because, uh, you know, you don't get rich down there. At least I don't, and he doesn't. And I don't think anybody there for the right reason does. But why would you do this? Well. I'm going to start way back, okay? I, I grew up, how many of you uh, actually have lived in Robeson Ranch for five years or less? And how many of you came from another state? Mike, where'd you come from? California? That's right. I mean, I came from Kansas. Anybody here come from Ohio? I believe there's a few from all over the place. But I, I was, Lori and I were blessed to come here, but I grew up in Kansas on a farm ranch, and my mom and dad, uh, though they did not have a college degree, they worked hard and they did an awesome job. We grew up in a, I grew up in a little community that was a farming community. There was probably only 15 last names, and they're all German, and it was a little Mennonite community. And they worked hard. In 1969, my dad uh, developed a brain tumor. He had a severe headache all the time and developed a brain tumor. He had surgery and then unfortunately passed away uh, in 1970. And there were six of us kids. My mom uh, basically looked at the six of us and said, one, you're all gonna know Jesus, and two, you're all gonna get a college degree. And we did not have a lot of uh, social ec economic ability. It, we, we, we got by, as most people farming and ranching, there's about this much between profitability and bankruptcy. But it was a great way to grow up. Unfortunately, the, the, the Vietnam War was going on. My oldest brother got drafted and had to leave to go to, to the Vietnam War. And my next oldest brother uh, was 18, and he got a college scholarship to go play college football. And that was one way we could get it paid for, so he left. So my mom and my sisters and I kept farming. We had uh, a couple hundred head of cattle, 200 head of sheep, and about 50 sows. But it was a great way to grow up and a great way to work, and she made sure all six of us got a college degree. We're blessed, too, that five of the six of us married our college sweethearts and one our high school sweetheart, and I'm probably married the least of all of them as far as the number of years. But my second degree uh, was, at, uh, my, both of my degrees were from Kansas State University. My second degree it was a veterinary degree. And while I was getting my degree, I, I ran into that beautiful lady named Lori and uh, started dating, and ultimately we got married. But I did not like the winters in Kansas, because uh, when we had a snowstorm in junior high and high school, I didn't go home and look out the window. I went home and fed cattle and hogs and sheep, because if they died, we, we had no, we know, I didn't know government might give you a dollar or something. I didn't know there was any other way. So I went home and took care of those. But when I was in vet school, I knew I didn't want to come back to that area and do both small and large animal. Because every time you have a bad event, you end up with a colic horse or a cow trying to have a calf, including a blizzard. So I got in my car spring break of my senior year and drove to Texas, didn't know anybody. Drove down through Denton County, all the way down to UT, to San Antonio, over to College Station, back through the Rose Capital of of the world, uh, Tyler, Texas, and then back up to Manhattan, finished my last six weeks, and turned around and drove to Denton. Not knowing anybody, I just wanted to start uh, fresh and start new. My wife uh, followed me down after she got her college degree as a science teacher and a coach, and she swears I married her for her money because she had a six or seven year old pinna with no air conditioning and $2,000 in the bank, and I had nothing more than a folder about th that thick of student loans. But North Texas was a blessing for us. Uh, we were able to raise our three kids here. Uh, we found a great church, Denton Bible Church. I was able to not only provide for my family, but I gave back. I gave back in so many ways. We, we started Denton Young Life in 1986. We, uh, I was on the school board for 15 years. 
Um, I was the president of Denton County Veterinary Medical Association for eight years. I was uh, on the executive board of the chamber for many years, but on and on and on. And then as we grew our vet practice, because we were blessed, because when I got here in Denton County, this place, I, went, I used to come out and do animals where Robeson is. There was, there was no such thing as Robeson. And there was only 140,000 people in the county. And today there's over a million. And I was blessed because of that, because we grew and we grew and we grew. I had 9,000 active clients. So when it came uh, one day that the uh, incumbent was no longer running, uh, Lori and I had gone to Denton Bible Church and on the way home I said, Lori, I think, you know, we, you know, we, we need to pray about this and I think we need to consider running for Texas House District 64. And I was blessed to say that she said, you know, after a few, like, why, what would we do, you know, all this, that she was 100% on board. And we did. And why were we going to run? Well, not only for us, but uh, I, th I see she changed my sc screensaver to our grandbaby here. But we're ra we ran because of, uh, we, not, we were blessed in, in what we, the quality of life that we had here. And our kids are blessed. And we want our kids and grandkids to have those same opportunities that we did. So that's why we took it on. And so uh, there was no other reason for us to be down there other than that. And the good thing is that we're one of the few that our, our kids are already raised, they're already gone, they can come visit us. We just married our youngest one on July the 3rd and she's 29 years of age. So to a wonderful Christian man. So that's why we're, we're there. And I say we because she's in it as much as I. Now, uh, I met Ellen the first time in 2016, El Ellen Sullivan, and she asked me uh, a question while standing in line to a, a UNT football game. She said, are you Lynn Stuckey? And I said, yes. And she said, are you a conservative? And I said, yes, ma'am, I am. And she said, uh, I said, I do, I do believe that every student and every child in this state should be able to get a quality education. And I was one of the underprivileged that you know we have to have a minimum quality education uh, in the public education system. And she, she, she agreed, but, but that was my first opportunity to, to see and to meet her. But from there, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the last couple sessions. Uh, the last two sessions, uh, the 87th legislative session was considered not just by us, but by other states, the most conservative session ever on record in, in any state. When we had uh, so many big wins, we got rid of uh, abortion, uh, we've had uh, gun right, uh, much uh, you know, improvement with the, the uh, passage of, of uh, open care or constitutional care. Thank you. Um, and we did a lot of things uh, with, you know, make it harder to cheat and easier to vote. Uh, and, but all those things, you have to come back many times and tweak. And I know this session we came back on the, uh, on the election thing and we added a, make it a felony if you are doing something illegal in the voting. But we had a very, very uh, conservative session two sessions ago. And in this session, we're not done. We've got some great wins, and the latest and the best and the biggest win that, that we had so far is the, the $18 billion tax relief package that we just got done. Now, I had some people say, you know, I was frustrated because you guys are down there bickering amongst yourself and you're not getting something done. But that's part of the process. The House and the Senate and the governor, they all have their own ideas, and we all work on those, and we try to come to, through debate, to a conclusion that is gonna be best for everybody. And two weeks ago, when I was at ALEC, I had the opportunity to sit down with governor, or Lieutenant Governor Patrick, and he, he agreed. He said, you know, if it wasn't for all of us working back and forth, we wouldn't have got the great bill that we got. And, uh, and he said, I commend Dave Phelan and Governor Abbott for all of us being able to get together and finally get that done. And what does that mean for you guys? Well, it depends a lot on the tax rates, but uh, you should see a thousand to a fourteen hundred dollar minimum savings. And if you're 65 or older, you don't get the hundred thousand dollar homestead exemption. You get 110. The other question I keep getting from people that are retired is, do do we, you know, if our taxes are frozen on on the school part, and there's a reduction, do we get any reduction? And yes, we passed another bill, SB 2021 that's actually gonna keep bringing it down. So it'll reset and reset. 
Now, what we have to have you guys all do on November is go out and vote for this. And when we passed this law, finally, we couldn't do it with just the Republicans. We had to have at least 100. And so we had uh, 100, uh, well over 100 that agreed. I think there was only two that voted against it. With that, are you ready to start talking about, I mean, I can talk a lot on, on this session, but if yeah. you want to start with some of the questions. Right, let's start, yeah, let's go with the questions. We're going to be going over questions about some of this stuff. Okay. We're going to delve into it more. So okay. uh, if you want to just jump up here, you can go up the stairs. Either one. Yes, sir. <laughs> so I don't know if I ever needed this one. Oh, well, you do for the, uh, for the video. Oh, okay. Do you, have, do you have a place you want, a particular side you want? Okay. All right. It, it doesn't matter. We'll let Dr. Tuck, you can you pick, want me? Yeah, why don't you get theirs so okay. they can probably see you a little better. Oh, that's okay. No, you keep it so that y'all thank you so they can hear you. There we go. Y'all all know Jill Glover. I'm not sure what her title is. It's a long, multi-word <laughs> title, but she's a big kahuna, that's all I know, in the uh, State Texas. Republican Executive Committee. There you, you go. Can you turn the, is that on? <laughs> Are we good? All right, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for sitting down and um, answering questions. And honestly, I wish we could do this with all of our reps um, because we got we got some really great questions um, as far as the legislative priorities are concerned. And I would love to be able to ask all of our Denton County reps um, the same questions, so or similar ones that we have gotten here. Um, I also noticed that you brought a flyer with some of our legislative priority bills. Um, and I think these are all ones that you voted for, um, I believe. And so some of the bills that we'll be talking about are on the flyer that um, I think was passed around. So that's great. All right. Uh, very first one has to do with our first priority, protecting our elections. Election integrity was the number one priority of Republicans on the 2022 primary ballot, as well as the number one priority for RPT state delegates in 2020 and 2022. Please address the election integrity concerns of the voters in Denton and Wise County. Well, as I said, I want to try to make it as simple as possible. We want to make it easier to vote and harder to cheat. And we, and we, did, we worked on that uh, through a number of bills. Um, and, you know, I don't always uh, co-author or go or author or be part of every bill that's, that's headed that direction because some of them are going to move forward and some of them are not. And once, once we start seeing that what is picking up steam, uh, then we uh, make sure that that bill has the things in it that we need. And uh, that will be actually helping us in the elections. Um, the, uh, the one thing that we didn't get finished was uh, that we didn't make it a felon, felony to, to commit you know, an act of illegally voting and so that got done this second session or the ADA session right okay so that that got passed out is there always room to tweak yes we need feedback and again I uh, think uh, Steve said you know I'm I'm your representative so I need feedback I need you guys to, to get with me and Jill I'd love to have you come to my office like we've never done this would come to my office and sit down and talk about this. Actually, we did. If you'll remember last session, I came and talked to you about I, gender modification. I, I asked, yeah, I asked you to come in at the Capitol. It was at, yep. at the Capitol. Yes. Yes. But I'd like, I'd like to, to have a formal <laughs> meeting. I was in and out because you have to just see you in the hallway. Yep. All right. Priority number two. Next question. This has to do with securing the border and protecting Texans. You were co-author on two of 14 of our approved priority bills regarding border protection. Um, did you have objections to the other 12 bills that you were not co-author? Yeah, I would on? have to go over each one of those individually. Okay. Probably not. Um, and we wanted, we, I definitely want to see the border closed. And we've been with Governor Abbott. We've been working very hard to get a lot of things done. When I first got elected, our border security uh, budget, and I'm appropriator, a budget writer, was $800 million, uh, uh, per two years. We just passed one that's $5.1 billion. 
And we shouldn't have to do that at the state. That should be the federal government. But as we know, the Joe Biden group has failed us miserably, and we've had to do it ourselves. We know that we have to have, we have, to have barriers, we have to have technology, and we have to have boots on the ground. And we're continuing to work on that. The buoy system is one of the latest things that's been put in. Uh, you know, and, and we're getting a lot of slack from the other side, and I don't care, but the reality is, it is not inhumane. Uh, where it started was where there was multiple drownings, and uh, that buoy system has a net underneath it that goes all the way to the, to, uh, to the bottom, or at least far enough that they can't dive under. And uh, so it makes it almost impossible for them to get over without help. Now, those cost five million per mile, versus a border wall is 27 million per mile. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, we had 8,049 bills come through us uh, this last session. Yes. So I can't quote you every bill, but I can tell you, if, if you want to come sit down and talk about the other ones, I'll be glad to do it. Uh, I'm, there's none of them, none of the priorities that I'm aware of that, uh, that I've voted against, okay? In fact, you know, they were very important to me, just like they are to you. Uh, priority number four, stop sexualizing Texas kids. There were 22 uh, Republican Party of Texas approved bills that dealt with stopping the sexualization of children and five that made it to the governor's desk. And you have got those five and, and you voted for all of those, mm -hmm. of course, on this flyer. Um, and, and Jill, it's so hard to, to get up to the governor's desk yes. because we, you know, we... Yes. It's not like going to heaven where there's one way and one way only. Right. We are making sausage. Right. And you have to go this way and that way and up and over right. and under. And it was, it's amazing we got five and we'll get more. So you co-authored one of those. Um, but one of them, uh, since Denton has had problems with drag queen performances in front of children, why did you not co-author SB 12? Uh, to my knowledge, I thought I co-authored all of them, but I'll have to go back okay. and look, okay? So, so Representative the, Patterson what, did co-author this one, and uh, so did Representative yeah. Baumgartner, And I sometimes so. uh, what happens, too, is when they go over to be an SB, uh, we, can't, we have to go through a really long, lengthy process to become a co-author, and this, was, this is actually ended up being an SB bill, okay. not a House bill, a Senate yes. bill. So, okay. Um, why did you agree to allow Democrats to be in committee chair positions? Well, I never agreed to allow Democrats to be in committee chairs. The, since the, for the last 70 whatever years, that uh, is always up to the Speaker of the House. And the Speaker, uh, when we are elected, uh, we are obviously meet every other year. We meet on the second Tuesday of the odd year of January, and we go for 140 days straight. On the very first day we're, that we're there, uh, we are sworn in, and then we vote on our speaker, and then the speaker's team passes us out a little card on your, your top three priorities uh, personally, and your uh, priorities uh, based on how long you've been there that you wanna be on the committee. So you turn those in, they go through all that, and they come up with which committees you're on. Uh, the last three, uh, sessions i have been a vice chair which i would have loved to have been a chair right but i've been a vice chair the last three sessions right to a committee that i like this last one uh, county fairs how there were six republicans and three democrats mm -hmm. i would have preferred to be the chair yes but you know what as a vice chair with six republicans and three democrats we were able to, to do what we need to do in controlling Okay, and that, that actually does lead into the next part of that question, um, that you had hoped you would be named chair of the County Affairs Committee, and yet you were made vice chair under uh, Victoria Naeve, a Democrat who fled to Washington at the end of the 87th session. Um, how do you feel about being put under a Democrat, and do you think you would have done a better job, and do you agree with Speaker Phelan's decision for chair? Well, I, you always want to say you think you'll do a better job, because I, I think I would do a better job. <laughs> uh, but... You know, and, and the first thing that we have to do to, uh, first of all, I don't ever want to be like Washington, D.C., okay? Uh, we haven't, they don't get anything done. Tell me, did somebody tell me one thing they've done recently that, that helped you? We've got lists and lists of things. So we don't follow the, the way they do things, but 
the, the past, whether the House or the Senate, there's always been a rule to have some minority members as chairs. We actually throttled it way back after they left, like Victoria did. And I, again, what my statement was, anybody who got up uh, and abandoned their constituents and their duties and left should be disciplined for that. Okay. That's right. And one of the things that we did do is we changed the, the rules. Yeah. We changed the rules this on the first day where it is a $500 a day per fine for you breaking quorum. Right. And that uh, can't come from your campaign account, can't come from your state budget. It's got to come out of person. And then if you don't pay it within a certain period of time, it gets worse. It right. gets to the point where, you know, I, we'd love to set it to where they get, they lose everything. Right. Okay. Because the worst thing in the world is to be down there when they're gone and we don't have a quorum. Not only do we have to come in, we don't have to come in five days a week, and at the beginning of the session in January, we're usually there about three days a week, and then we can do our own office stuff and work on our bills, and we can usually go home and see our family on the weekend. By the end of May, we're there seven days a week. But when, you, when they're gone, we have to check in every day. You get a little, I got all, I took up my slips, different colored slip every day. That, that said, you know, when we got there and they went and excused you that you were going to come back the next day. Mm -hmm. And we would have gone after those people if we legally could have, but once they are out of the state of Texas, we don't have any jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, yes, I'm 100% I'm, I'm as, just as frustrated as anybody else in here about that. And let me, believe me, it did not gain them anything. When they got back, we still passed mm -hmm. the conservative things that we we're going to pass, mm -hmm. and and uh, hopefully we're going again. We're going to pass a lot more. So, so of the seven bills that you co-sponsored, none was for gun rights. What is your position on defending our Second Amendment rights? Well, the fact that I have probably about fifty guns at home, <laughs> and uh, well, you know, in my first uh, session uh, or my, my first election cycle, uh, I had been threatened by people because of false accusations and had my life threatened, and my wife's life threatened, and I had to call the uh, sheriff's department out and say, look, this guy comes on my property, my, I feel threatened for my family, for my wife, for my staff, and I will shoot the guy. And they agreed, okay. I'm 100% behind our second right amendments, and I, and I know how important you are, and I passed and voted for every one of those, and I worked very closely with Matt Schaefer on the strongest bill that we've ever had go through and the most conservative bill we've ever had go through the Texas House. Yes, and that, that was the one legislative priority that we did get fulfilled in full in the 87th session. And I'm disappointed carry. that, that yeah. Matt's not coming back. I understand his family should be more important than coming down to Austin, but yeah. he was a great member. All right. And he'll, I'll still get to work with him because like we have a one or two more sessions coming up. On enforcing parental rights and educational freedom, you served for several years on the school board becoming a state representative. What is your position on educational freedom? My position has evolved, I think, like a lot of people in this room. When I was in, in school uh, and the family unit was much stronger, uh, public education was the place to be. And honestly, you know, as one of six that grew up on a farm in a ranch in Kansas, my mom didn't have the ability to haul us anywhere. She didn't have the money to pay anything. We had to have a quality minimum education. Uh, but when I get calls, like I did recently, from parents saying, my fourth grade teacher asked my kid, what pronoun do you want to be called, called by? Then I know it's time that we have to have more parental empowerment. Our governor, Governor Greg Abbott, asked me to, to, to introduce him at Calvary Academy at Denton Bible Church, and I said, I'd love to. And the reality is, what I want to see is a quality program that still takes, it doesn't tear it from the haves and the have-nots. I want to see the most social economic disadvantaged kid to be able to move to a private school if they need to. And I, want to, and I want to make sure that everybody gets the opportunity to have parental empowerment and 
utmost thing is to have a quality education for every child in the state. If it wasn't for me, or for my mom and, and my education and my other brothers and sisters, I surely wouldn't be on the stage today. Um, I wouldn't have the opportunity if I didn't come to Texas and I didn't get multiple degrees and be able to provide for my family. And so we need to prepare our kids for the next level. Not all of them are going to go to college. In fact, one of the bills that I passed uh, this session was to have the technical college to put up, set up a new school in Denton County, which will allow people that don't want to go to college, but they want to get a, a uh, career that they can make money. And they can, if what I say is what would my definition of, of uh, whether we were successful or not is, do you have a job that you love to go to? And you love to go to work, and when you and you can, and then you also can provide for your family. If you've done that, then we were successful. That's. I don't like the, the big tests that these kids have. In fact, our middle one was dyslexic, and she could not do do within a certain period of time. She had to have help. Okay. So that this ends the section on the legislative priority questions, and then. Um, there were just some other general questions, and you've already mentioned this a little bit in terms of uh, the tax cut. But um, one of the important issues, in fact, this actually came in number nine uh, on our legislative priorities, so it didn't quite make the cut. I think um, probably had Roe v. Wade been repealed prior to state convention, then um, probably property tax would have been in the top eight. Um, but. Um, one of the important issues of the 88th session and two special sessions was property tax reduction. Mm -hmm. You and others have stated that you passed the largest tax cut in history. Could you explain that since it was only $12 billion when in 2008 there was a $14.2 billion cut? It was $18.3 billion. No matter how we slice it, it was 18.3. And there, there will be people that argue that it was the biggest but I 100% uh, will say, I'm not going to sit here and argue the, the little points. This was the biggest tax cut ever, and there were a lot of reasons for that. In, in two sessions ago, we revamped how you fund that public education. What I want to see is that ultimately we take the burden of the maintenance and operation from school tax off the backs of our property tax payers, and it be taken by the state. And we have to do that slowly because we only have a two-legged stool here in the state, and that's one reason we have the Texas miracle. We do not have a state income tax. In fact, we passed a law last in its 87th to prevent us from ever having a state income tax. Now, the good news is we're growing at you know, 1,200, 1,300 people per day, and Diane is at about 90 a day in Denton County. 92. 92 a day in Denton County. And that's good and bad, both. But the reality is, if we can keep the Texas miracle going, and if we can find uh, this revenue that we finally had, because I've been on appropriations three sessions, and the other two sessions, the comptroller told us we're gonna have a deficit budget. We are not like the federal government that will just print money. I don't want my kids having that debt, and we, we will not do that. So what we had to do was cut agencies. With the Texas Miracle going and these uh, industries and everybody coming here, we have been able to put a lot more money away and we've been able to give back $18.3 billion to the taxpayers. And what I want to see is that that maintenance and operation that we compressed, and that was part of the argument between the House, the Senate, and the Governor. Actually, on the first special session, the Governor specifically said, I want tax relief to our citizens in the form of at least $16 billion through compression only. Mm -hmm. He wanted compression only. Uh, Dan Patrick, who you know, is a great, great guy and a great legislator, he wanted homestead exemption only. And we got into a stalemate. Mm -hmm. And it took a while, but they all came together and we got a better, uh, we got something better out of it than like, either one of the plans because we have a 10.7 penny compression, and I want, to, I want to see that keep going down to where we totally get rid of the maintenance and operation. And over the next five to 10 years, we can do that, mm -hmm. as long as we have the Texas miracle continue. So follow-up question to this is, why did you vote to table an amendment offered by Representative Tenderhold, and this was during the regular session, that would have increased the tax cut to the 2008 levels of $20 billion, which would be adjusted for inflation? Because we have spending caps, and it, it was uh, unconstitutional because of the spending caps. Okay. 
The legislature also passed the largest spending increase in Texas history, $62 billion more than two years ago, which is a 42 percent increase. How did Republicans justify such an increase? Well, I don't think it's $62 million, but we would have to pull the numbers out. I believe the last budget was $303 billion, and this one now is $321.7. That difference is about $18 billion, in spite of the fact that we also upped the ante for the border of $5.1 billion, upped the ante for uh, education and uh, mental health and many other things uh, that, that are necessary. We still, uh, we did an amazing job. I don't know where you came up with that number, okay. but uh, I'd be glad for you to get with my chief of staff and we go over that because uh, we did not, we, we actually have got a lot more done and we it decreased the general revenue that we spent okay. doing that. You authored um, uh, House resolution, uh, House, I believe this was House bill, it's Ms. Brent on my, uh, questions, 5105 relating to authorizing Denton County to impose a hotel occupancy tax for the purpose of funding a new county event center. Could you explain how this bill will affect county citizens, and is this something that a majority of your constituents requested? I don't think I had anybody tell me they didn't want it. Okay. What is it? Uh, it's frequently referred to as a hot, hot bill, hot hotel oxley tax bill. And there's a couple ways that we can do this. First of all, you know, like I said, when I got here, there were, when Lori and I got here, there's 140,000 people in this county. Now there's over a million. I'd like, you know, do we have to go to Dallas to go to everything? Do we need to go to a boat show in Dallas, to an RV show? Do we need to go to a graduation, to one of these uh, graduate, whether it be college or high school, uh, somewhere else because we don't have a facility? Does the Denton Fairgrounds need to be able to grow, even though they're landlocked with 20-some acres right there in Denton? Yeah. Do we uh, want to have more recreation that we can have, whether it be ballparks or uh, places, uh, lakes, the fish, etc.? The best way to do that is not to raise our property tax, but it's to get the money somewhere else. And the one way to do it is, is a hot bill. And what does a hotel Aussie tax bill do? It adds up to $2 per $100 for every stay at a hotel. So the majority of the money for this new exhibition center on 300 acres north of Denton, right off the interstate, where we'll have an indoor closed arena, air-conditioned arena for our, our rodeos. We'll have, be able to do all kinds of things inside. will mostly be funded by people that have come to visit us here in Denton County. And with that, because of the requests I had in so many of them, and I also had that in Wise County, that we passed one in Wise County too. And it is going to help with the restoration and the continual maintenance of the, of the courthouse, the historic courthouse. It's going to help with the parks there, and it's going to help with their programs also. Okay. One of the committees that you served on was the Resolutions Committee. Can you please explain how this committee passed a resolution celebrating contributions of LGBTQ folks, uh, which is contrary to our party platform? Well, I'm only one vote, dude. Okay. And uh, so I couldn't kill it by myself, okay? But there, yeah, you could try. Um, and most of those got knocked down. I think there was one or two of those that happened, and then we were finally be able to go not only to the chairman, who was a Democrat, uh, but to uh, the leadership and say, uh, we're just gonna kill them all if you keep bringing these and allowing them to happen. Mm -hmm. And so there was some changes made, and that was probably one of them that was mm -hmm. early on uh, in mm -hmm. the legislature, especially January or February. Right, yes, that's that one. is correct. Given that Mr. Hugh Brady, one of the House parliamentarians, was a Democrat that President Obama appointed as general counsel for the White House Office of Administration, would you protest his reappointment if you are reelected? I'd have to do my research on that one. Uh, okay. You know, what, the one thing that frustrated me a lot and, and that he might be involved with is the number of point of orders. 
uh, and they were yeah. ridiculous. We need to rework how we do the point of orders. Yeah. And of course, you know, we're, let's look back historically. Our forefathers wanted to make it very hard to pass bills and very easy to kill bills. And without a super majority of Democrats, this tax relief bill wouldn't have come to you guys for the vote in, in November. We had to have 100 votes on that, okay? So you can't just uh, say, hey, talk to the hand, and you have to work. Now, going back to Brady, uh, if, if we review all of the bills that he allowed to be uh, point orders that were pork priorities, then yes, I would. Okay. Should Texas legislators have term limits? If so, what? If not, why not, given that the mayor of Denton and the president of the United States both have term limits? I'm, I'm good with term limits, but I will tell you this. You know, it's like being on the school board. I don't, it doesn't matter how long you're there, you learn more and more and more, okay? Would I have been effective, as effective as a freshman as I am uh, on, in my fourth term? No, I couldn't have because I didn't know and have the relationships. Part of it's relationship building. Personally, what I believe is there should be nobody in state or federal government that didn't have to you know, go out and make a living on their own first, not be a career politician. But unfortunately, there are many of them, and they got there because they had a silver spoon in their mouth, and they got elected because of it. Everybody needs to worry about paying their property tax. Everybody needs to go to bed concerned about, will I be able to pay the electric bill, or will electricity come on? And everybody uh, that has dealt with other people like that and paying their property tax is much more qualified to make decisions than somebody who's never, ever worried about being able to survive. All right, we're down to the last two questions. There are some who question the motives of the speaker donating large amounts of money to a representative's campaign, particularly in areas of reliably Republican voters. You took over $100,000 from Speaker Phelan. How does this affect your votes, and would you take that amount of money again? I didn't take any money from Speaker, from Speaker Phelan. What I did is I got in-kind contributions from Speaker Phelan. Now, every uh, speaker in the past that has had incumbents that were good incumbents that did things, and again, I know we didn't get all our priorities done, and we got to work on those. But folks, consider the fact that in the 87th and the 88th le legislative session, not based on us, but based on other states, they will tell you those are the two most conservative sessions in Texas history and in most states' histories. So I know I've heard this before. You took $100,000 from Dave Phillip. No, he went out and polled, and he went out and av did advertisements for me and when you put those mailers out there, folks, those mailers are $30,000 a piece, depending on who you do it. So I'm assuming, and I never was asked, I never was uh, told what was gonna be on them. He did that on his own accord to multiple uh, representatives, just like every other House Speaker has done before that. But that's an in-kind contribution. And last but not least, I know you guys went off on that, on date, some of them, but what about uh, the in-kind contributions I got from Greg Abbott? You didn't, you didn't say anything about that. It wasn't as much, but I got some of there, but still. Do you wanna, do you wanna speak to that? I'll speak to that. Uh, he believes I'm a good representative. He supported me and he did the same thing as Dave. He went out and he advertised, I said, Lynn Stuck, he's a great rep. I don't even, I mean, we could pull up, somebody could probably be able to find the mailers that went out. And he did that for me. But I never took a dime from Dave Phelan, and I never took a dime from Greg Abbott. They did those things for me, and I have to report them as in-kind contribution. Okay. Last question. Where do the opinions of your constituents come into play in how you decide to vote on particular bills? And can you give two examples, one when you voted with constituents, and then another when you voted against their wishes? Well... I'm trying to think of when I voted against her wishes. The only time I think I would have voted against her wishes would be if, it, if I knew it was biblically wrong, I, I still would have voted the biblical way. But I will tell you, like every, every session, when we get there, in, you know, uh, we were at a event earlier today, Richard Hayes said he got 800 emails in one day. That's not, that's not real unusual. 
you get emails, a lot of emails. Some of those are coming from our constituents. Some of them are coming from California or New York. Well, they're not real priorities for us. It's our constituents, and it's the Republican, the biblical conservative values that, that mean a lot to me. I want my kids and I want my grandkids to have the same opportunities we did and to have a safe place that was uh, founded like our country was with biblical values, to live and to raise their family and to, and to enjoy. And I am blessed, Lori and I are blessed to be here. Uh, this is home for us. And, and I'll give her this a million times for me, but I'm gonna say it again. My kids all had, have that I'm a native Texan bumper sticker. We didn't have that one. We, were, we couldn't pick where we were born, but we have the one that said, I wasn't born here, got here as fast as I could. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And please, folks, if you have any questions at any time, we're open to hear from you. The best way to do it, I'd love to have coffee with you. I had coffee with a group of guys a couple of days ago at the grill. I'd buy you a coffee or whatever. If you want to sit down and talk about a specific issue, please contact me. I will do everything I can to do that. Granny. We're probably going to be back in Austin at the end of September for one or two more sessions. So, yep. Steve, you got another prize? Yes, sir. Here you go. <laughs>